Hello, listeners. How how's everybody doing? This is Chen. I'm a uh, cultural historian of、uh, early medieval Europe and the late medieval China. And today, with me to discuss、um, the idea of Haman the Herder is my friend Aron. Hello, Aron. How are you doing? Hello, Chen. I'm Aron. I mainly focus on German philosophy of 1920th century. And yes, I'm excited to do this. Yeah, so today we'll continue our conversation from last time,、uh, further exploring the、uh, remaining two philosophers introduced in the Sir Berlin's book, Three Critiques of the Enlightenment. Today we will focus on、um, Hamann and Herder. So before we go into the potato meat of the content, I'd love to provide a short、uh, historical background to know, like what. Kind of stuff is going on in their society, and a、uh, short biographical sketch of the two philosophers before talking about the ideas. So both of them operated in 18th century, the Kingdom of Prussia. Prussia in the 18th century was marked by two、uh, features. One is intensified state building. The other is、um, military expansion and political centralization.、Um, these two trends were especially pronounced during the reign of、uh, Frederick I, Frederick William I, and Frederick II, or more famously known as the Great. So during the former's reign, or so-called the Soldier King from 1713 to 1740,、um, Frederick William I did not care too much about art, but Was noted for his thrift and practical policy policy orientation. He、uh, he was a mastermind behind Prussia's celebrated bureaucracy and the professional standing army building. And the latter,、um, the great,、um, who reigned from 1740 to 1786, practiced the so-called enlightened absolutism. Continuing his father's emphasis on the military, he further developed Prussia's set of mili-、uh, the army and made Europe the best. This army won for Frederick the Great many of his、um, wars. So, besides、uh, military expansion,、um, Frederick the Great introduced a general civil code and, most importantly, established the principle that the crown should not intervene in、um, matters of justice. Finally, he also advanced the process of secondary education system, which prepared the、um, brightest pupils for university education. And、um, today, Germany's、um, gymnasium system can trace its institutional root to、um, this king's establishment. So, after Frederick、um, the Great's death, there came the French Revolution and the Napoleon, yada yada yada. Well, the rest is history. So it's in this milieu、um, Hamann was born. He was born in 1730 in Königsberg, a very important administrative and political center of、um, Prussia. He, a, a Lutheran, studied the theology at the University of Königsberg, and afterwards he worked in the industry, both in the private sector as a clerk for merchants and in the、uh, public sector、um, by holding a series of low-rank、um, public offices throughout his life. Um, Hamann was preoccupied with、uh, philosophy and engaged in、um, uh, intellectual conversations、um, through private correspondence and publications. He wrote under the pen name of the、uh, Ma- Magus of the North, and、uh, his own writing mainly consists of、uh, essay noted for two characteristics. First is their brevity. Especially in comparison with other、uh, contemporary works, the second is their breadth of allusion and delight. In, indulgement and extended the allegories analogies, and、um, one final fact before、um, we go into his、uh, ideas is his translations of David Hume from English to German、uh, was very influential and、um, had a long-lasting effect for the、um, future Enlightenment, Kant Enlightenment development. Speaking of which, Aron, would you like to take on and elaborate for our listeners what, in your eyes, is the spirit? Of the Enlightenment, and in that framework, how did say counter Enlightenment come into the picture? Yeah. So, what is interesting about figures like Ed Hamann is that they are, in one sense, they get their identity, they receive their identity as reactionary forces, and this reaction is not necessarily with a negative connotation,、uh, but it, it just Implies that the spirit of time had shifted so incredibly towards 
celebrating the ideals of the Enlightenment, that it was almost impossible to just be neutral about this. Either you would become a proponent and elaborator and modifier of the Enlightenment ideals, or a criticism, a soft criticism wouldn't have been enough, and there had to be some um, immense force to just make a point against this dominance because it was a dominating force. And as you were um, describing it in your uh, historical context part, it was like finding its way to all elements of the human life in the West, in the Prussia and Scotland in different ways. Um, and because of that, it's, it's, it was it was something to be dealt with. And someone like Haman was also a character that Berlin calls part of this um, group of counter enlightenment people. Um, but in terms of like what this enlightenment implies, there are several features that both Berlin mentions, and it's could, could derivable from the criticism of enlightenment as well. And one of the most important features is this idea of uh, common nature, like in essential essentiality when it comes to human nature. So human nature has an essence, and that essence is fundamentally prior to the expressions of human interactions, meaning that traditions, customs, religions, all of that, uh, there are either expressions of that common denominator that constitutes the human nature, or they are confused misrepresentations of that nature, and they should be dealt with. Right? They are stuff that are not really in our nature, but because of some miscalculation, misapprehension of uh, our nature, uh, they have popped out. Right, So when we are thinking about humanity in this sense, the general course of action is to determine this human nature, this essence, and then start to plan societies and education systems, modifications in the societal structures, a criticism of religion, all of that based on this understanding of the human essence. What is important is that this common denominator stands above, or transcends the particularities. It's, it's something that is not consumed by the particularities, but it consumes the particularities. And also it shows itself in like expressions like human beings are like essentially rational, right? Um, something about the human nature in that sense, but also it expresses itself in human ideals, right? We will see a lot of attempts to see like, to answer the question of value, right? What is valuable for human beings? And we, of course, see the diversity of values in human societies, but could we reduce that to a principle? Happiness, maybe. Liberty, maybe, right? Justice, maybe. So that's a very much of an enlightenment approach in really finding the core of human nature and therefore the human goal. And because rationality also becomes very important in this idea that, first of all, the unfolding of the universalities is the business of reason, right? It is reason that goes and looks for the essentialities, looks for the essential values, the principal values, and plans for it. And also with this reason and considering reason as the essential aspect of being a human being, starts to change everything else that wasn't thought through that lens before. And it's one of those fascinating examples that Berlin gives about like how did this influence Christianity? Now, instead of thinking of miracles as like, you know, suspensions uh -huh. of uh, the physical laws, now suddenly someone like Wolf as a theologian starts talking about this astrophysical Jesus who just was really good at manipulating the existing laws of physics to be able to walk on water. And like that is species of explanations 
that I suspect was not present in like early medieval times. That doesn't seem to be necessary. I'm sure there were people who were trying to find rational, quote unquote, rational explanations for like biblical commandments, but the role of that rationality was very different from this enlightenment, post-enlightenment uh, approach, which again sh shows itself even in like political writings of John Locke and the way he quotes Bible. Like the way that he quotes Bible starts to, uh, there is a switch. Like he quotes Bible to show that Bible is also rational while rationality and the principles of rationality have been decided independent from Bible. That's also something uh, very enlightenment-like, that the, the role of religion becomes, and faith uh, even uh, in general, becomes like, you know, maybe subsumed under reason, maybe it's assistant, mm -hmm. lower assistant, it's still there. It's that we don't just jump into like fully fledged atheism, but the meaning of it becomes like that. Like it becomes all the points that we are going to talk about in details about like tolerances also. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Like in so far as all we think about reason as the judge, right. every religion has something to contribute, right? And then the, the relationship between reason and religion becomes something quite different from what it was before that. And in Haman, that starts to... Um, it backfires. All of these ideas that I briefly mentioned and uh, Trent mentioned in the context of the um, development in uh, the social structure in the 18th century, Haman puts a big no in front of the, uh, those ideas. I think we can we can go ahead and start talking about the details but did you did you have something to add Trent? yeah yeah i just want to uh, listen as i say briefly summarize the three in my eyes in my listening very important points you say kind of embody or encapsulate that spirit of enlightenment the first is the concept of common denominator across like all human groups and the, the desire and the confidence that they're in the possibility to, to uncover such a thing that m makes the human beings a human, which are um, that optimism, that uh, dare to know spirit. Second is this desire of knowing such an essence also connected with expressions that are of uh, human ideas, which in inevitably bring in cultural um, symbolic system of which can be very diverse, but um, across such diversity, there is something supposedly connect all um, human society. There are some common ideals that all societies are dr driving afterwards, um, like what you mentioned, um, abstract terms like liberty, freedom, justice, etc. And finally, it's this once this radically new idea about self or human um, uh, was was in place, it won't just stop there. It will like go into many other spheres. It will influence the, uh, the society understanding about maybe property right, maybe about like a social relationship, maybe about many other things. Uh, and just a quick note on your uh, astrophysic Jesus that commented from. Um, Whoa, well, that's fascinating because uh, you met you, you you kind of implicitly asked me whether that was possible in early medieval Europe. Well, it was not even thinkable by like 14th, uh, 13th, or 14th century when scholasticism was already um, taking rationality and Aristotle's idea into its like a core curriculum. So, um, what's something I read comparing David Hume's and um, Thomas Aquinas, that is a late 13th century Parisian theologian, um, um, justification for the possibility of miracles. Um, both use a really rational in the um, Aristotle's concept of logic, that kind of mm -hmm. a consistent um, way to demonstrate uh, for Hume, miracles was out of the question, it was impossible. But for uh, Thomas Aquinas, it was absolutely necessary for the universe to exist. So I think you are, the the the, the observation, the, the, the uh, reference to two wolf was really interesting because of that way to think about whether God was, a, or providence was somehow subsumed or limited 
to a certain extent by the universal law discoverable by human beings. I think it's really important. So, yes, you're right. We should move on towards the Harmon. Yes, you want something to add? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I think that's a very good place to actually enter Harmon's world because faith versus reason Mm -hmm. is really important there. And his his very strange, in a way, right, like relationship with Hume and mm. Bible at the same time, right? You would think that Hume's skepticism is gonna even like influence Bible, and it just you know takes that away. But like he comes up with this kind of a mystical empiricism that like has the elements of like faithful Christianity and like this. Uh, celebration of contingency in the human mm. uh, human way, uh, but I think it's important. It, it is interesting to see this faith versus reason in Haman. It, it has a lot of interesting elements in it. One is that instead of he does the exact opposite of the Enlightenment approach, instead mm-hmm. of saying that every miracle is also reasonable. He says that everything that seems reasonable reasonable is at its core a miracle, right? Causality is illusionary, right? Which is a very human idea with a very religious twist to it, right? That not only miracles aren't reasonable, but every other quote-unquote law of nature that -hmm. you come up with it doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable it, it, on its own. You can come, you know, just like Hume, you can say that you can come up with like, you know, some good guesses, some right. like patterns, some like observed relationship, but there is no, you don't know anything about nature. So the fact that I am able to like, you know, raise my hand, mm-hmm. it's not that there is like a very, like the mechanistic story is what is really going on what right. is really going on is a miracle everything is a miracle and mm-hmm. just turns the whole you know core of enlightenment on its head right. and this he doesn't stop here reason is always secondary to faith faith is like the sun and reason is the moon that is reflecting the sun right mm-hmm. and also another like one of those beautiful pictures that Haman comes up with is that think about God as an artist, not a mathematician, Mm -hmm. right? Which is very much like, you know, if you think about someone like Descartes, right? Right. God is very much of a mathematician, right? The math, the language, the code of universe is mathematics. And if you want to know God, for instance, you need to know math. You need to know mathematical structure of the world, right? That's how you get to the knowledge. And when we get to where Herder, uh, Haman talks about knowledge, we can get back to this point that that is, God is not a mathematician at all. And God is this miraculous force that just creates like an artist. God thinks in trees and uh, beetles, right? That's what God um, is. So this primacy of faith becomes very important. Primacy of belief becomes very important. And that is gonna be bothersome for anyone who is a hardcore enlightenment mm-hmm. because everyone every thinker of the enlightenment era and they're you know still today it's right it's not, it's not fading away right the idea is that okay okay like faith is all right faith could be good in some situations psychologically psychological benefits of faith mm-hmm. but it's not you know, natural science is not based on faith, right? Mm-hmm. That's from the like an enlightenment picture, right? A perspective, just it's mathematics. It's it's all right, but and you will see in a very interesting way how mm-hmm. this religious Hamanian counter enlightenment approach surfaces again in the like twentieth and twenty first century in some. Like some of its descendants are in postmodern thinking. And a lot of those postmodern thinking try to undermine the solemn rationality of natural sciences, right? So this is not this is just a glimpse. 
that this is not good this hasn't gone away mm -hmm. it hasn't been resolved in, in that way there there is there, there is that the elements of that debate is still is uh, is with us and in some cases really needs some answers uh, right. right not that the counter enlightenment figures or the post postmodern thinkers um are accurate but their criticism has weight so anyway that's what i had to say about faith and reason um, Trent, do you have something to add to the faith and reason part? No, I think you did a very good job summarizing the key points there. Um, I'll go back to that probably when we are summarizing um, Haman's idea, because there is a, oh. uh, you mentioned what group of people would be offended by his, like turning the faith reason uh, dynamic on its head. But not they are not the only people who are offended. Another group of people, or many other groups of people, are people who also deal with the faith, but their faith would disagree or fundamentally clash with the Hamas Lutheran faith. We'll talk about that maybe in um in the end of this specific section. But before sure, yeah, yeah. um let's move on towards the second key point, yeah. which is the concept of abstraction as distortion. Do you want to elaborate yeah. that and yeah, how that so... connects with uh, the Enlightenment spirit? Yeah, so it's it's probably the most philosophically interesting part of this enlightenment counter enlightenment uh, debate, from my perspective, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is basically the nature of concepts. What is a concept, right? And for an enlightenment thinker, I mean, concepts could have different imports, but concepts are the way that we get to know reality through concepts we bring out the reality of the world that's how we get to know it now there are all, of course all sorts of nuances in this conception like in terms of like how basic these concepts are required to even interfere in our perception like in this story that kant wants to say that a very basic way of like actually seeing things as things concepts are involved very basic concepts are involved so that's even like a more a deeper version of understanding the role of concepts for someone like Haman which is not alone in this conviction mm -hmm. concepts are distortions mm -hmm. concepts do not take us to the reality of a different matter they actually cut us off from the reality he says how can a man who has mutilated his organs feel and i think right. that's how he understands the dominance of concepts right and we not only see the in him the opposite in a way like in the, the dominance of intuition in in ways like in the in, in his insistence on faith but it's more than that i think what he thinks is that concepts keep the concreteness of existence mm -hmm. out of the equation right abstraction just takes away what is important about any existing entity right and then pretends or in a good faith conflates that abstraction with the core reality of that entity now this could be true about understanding a flower and this could be true about understanding humanity right, right. it doesn't need it it just it is everywhere because the enlightenment obsession with conceptual analysis or conceptual discourse as a result of its celebration of reason to Haman is just an obscene deviation from the truth at hand. For Haman, analysis is dismembering. Both analysis and synthesis are equally arbitrary. All divisions are abstractions right and what happens for instance in the case of human nature according to Haman is that the common denominator approach abstract from the diverse set of particular cultures for instance that human beings have had right historical traditions costumes religions right. all that 
abstracts from all of that. And the abstraction is important to understand how he thinks of the abstraction. And I think it's important eventually to understand if whether he and the Enlightenment thinkers were wrong about what this abstraction actually is, right? And that abstraction is that, okay, find the, the common core, take away from this thing what makes it different and come up with some identity, like take away from Christianity what makes it Christianity, hold on to something that it could be juxtaposed right. with, like, you know, Buddhism, with Islam, right. with Deism, whatever. Like, now, you know, to go back, like, all of these, like, this element is just, like, taking away from the differences. Now, the way Berlin beautifully describes this approach, describes this uh, abstracting process, is that according to Haman, enlightenment is making an elegant front garden out of the depth, complex nature of humanity, right? The humanity is like, it's just like, I, I'm i like, go and like make a very pristine, sterilized garden that has right. like, every border is clear. And mm -hmm. then say that, oh, this is nature. Nature is not that. Nature is Amazon. Nature <laughs> is this madness and complexity. Right. And constant refusal to stand still that's nature now when we're talking about humanity and someone comes to the idea that okay humanity at its core is rationality humanity at its core is about you know high degree of agency humanity at its core is about acting morally mm -hmm. right? right all of these judgments all of these statements are just insanely wrong in their refusal to accept that no such a statement is possible regarding humanity right. uh, th there is no way that we could do that and when it comes to the human existence that mm -hmm. will show it for instance according to Haman in language like every language is a right. way of life right it's a pattern of ex experience it cannot be like you know subject to external criticism there is no archimedean point mm -hmm. outside of cultures for like critical examination there is nothing like that and a spontaneity uh, paralleling that point about miracles right a spontaneity is the name of the game it's just this constant movement of a creation and uh, change and yeah. you know recreation and reinterpretation just that's the reality of it now this garden of enlightenment is just a facade it's pr for you know thinkers <laughs> you know just like to to imagine to pretend that the answers are like you know okay we cannot and we can see some sort of parallel story here that i mm -hmm. notice in like thinkers or scientists who are very much interested in like mathematical models for instance mm -hmm. in our times that they, they look for what is quantifiable about humanity right and then they say okay that's humanity because it's easy to quantify they're just okay, okay so that's just what it means to be human beings that's just that quantify as because we can get to that very easily yeah, that, that must be it. That must be the entirety of human existence. And right. I think the same, like, that's the kind of a problem that Haman is notifying. That just because you can easily talk about, like, a moral code with these basic, you know, rules of the game that you created, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that, that you have captured the essence of human interaction and human conduct. Right, right. Um, it definitely provides... <laughs> Catherine of very rich ideas. Um, I just want to summarize, not to summarize it, but to re, uh, visit a certain points you mentioned and use it as a transition to the third point that is sort of, um, Hamas' idea of on human knowledge. Um, also, I'm quoting that from Berlin's very elegant summary. According to Berlin, Haman considers um, the Enlightenment project as a four stage alienation. I think uh, each one corresponds to a very interesting theme you introduced. First is it a pr that process of understanding or driving for a um, common denominator first uproots 
or in my vocabulary, I'll call it a decontextualize. So what makes, say, I don't know, 18th century Prussia comparable to 18th century Edo Japan, um, it's really that superimposed universal law of um, separating um, a, say, token of cultural expression from its um, holistic system on all the accumulated human experience and, and interaction that rendered meaning to such a, a token at the first place. So um, a, for Haman, it's a process of depriving a person of his or her tradition. And the second part, um, a se second stage of this alienation is uh, to dissociate particular, that the universal particular dynamic you mentioned, particular experiences by imposing upon that person universal laws, which I think to a large extent was informed or at least the, the subconscious by the state making uh, institution building um, process across Europe, not just the process. And a third is to, to dissociate or divorcing thinking from symbols and words. That goes to, to your point about the spontaneity and the really uh, the, the intricate complexity of uh, human languages, but uh, trying to, it reminds me uh, Chomsky, when you're talking about the scientists that were trying to quantify everything, once we have the uh, humanities and the social sciences to divide in, in, in our time, but uh, what I think here is really the uh, Noah Chomsky, at least in her his early work, trying to, to distill the universe grammar that is connected with human nature, but it also provides the kind of uh, infrastructure for any um, growth and development of human languages. That would just be, Haman would definitely have a heart attack to read the uh, Trump's success on that. The final one is, I think really interesting and go back to the, uh, what we started with. You mentioned a very interesting term that Haman is a very, to a certain extent, idiosyncratic the synthesis of the Bible and the David Hume. Annie, you, you you come up with a very <laughs> telling term, um, mystical empiricism. And here, I think that directly uh, addresses that. The final stage of alienation, according to Harman, is to differentiate what is not differentiable, what is not divisible. Each moment is the moment of a miracle. That experience is fundamentally unified, just like a human being, just like a culture. You cannot by imposing categories, abstracted concepts, therefore safely deconstruct or divide or um, decontextualize such experience and make it somehow connected either causally or experientially to other moments. Each miracle should be taken mm -hmm. in its own like right, you know, it, it, each human being or self must be treated with with be uh, must be accorded with a dignity to, to to a large extent. That's my reading on that. Mm. So, um, and I think all these four stages. I'll give you time to respond to what I just shared. Mm. Um, are fundamentally connected. If this enlightenment approach towards knowledge and understanding, there, um, which means that by um uh, coming up, uh, probing, and then um disseminating certain uh, universally applicable um, abstracted concepts is not a viable way towards self-knowledge, towards like human knowledge of the nature. So what do you, um, what Haman would consider as a more justifiable um, approach to a knowledge, which will, I think, connect with the mysticism part and uh, the faith part. But before that, you should... Uh, yeah, and I think, I, I think actually that the last point that you made is a very good way to get to the uh, third part too it, it is very interesting because what you're saying basically is you know replication of a mystical experience is right meaningless like what do you mean by replication of a mythical experience in the sense that you can just point it down, like point like extract the points of that experience and like distribute it as lecture notes, uh -huh. right? That doesn't make any sense in terms of the mystical experience. There is some uniqueness and particularity mm. and internal continuity to a mystical experience that is not translatable, that is not reducible to concepts. 
And I, and I think combining this with what, you know, there is no grand continuity. And I think that's a very human uh, way of looking at things, right? Just like a mystical experience is this, not necessarily discrete, but unique continuity, unique, you know, like thread right. that just came, just came together out of nowhere in a way, right? Right. Just like that's true about a mystic, mystical experience. That's also true about everything. That's right. also <laughs> like just we are not really looking Mm -hmm. It's how, you know, life actually works in terms of the, every how things come together. Right. And every moment of our lives is this type of unique on its own, irreducible to conceptual analysis right. experience. And any continuity that we craft, and mm -hmm. I want to say that I think Haman would have gotten uh, as far as Hume, uh, you know, I don't know the direct, I don't have a direct quote, but I think even like in something like the continuity of uh, the self, right. right? I don't think Haman, Haman would think that's also some sort of a construction uh, of uh, like not putting things like it's a construction in a way that it's continuity like if you want to give it, give it a little, little bit of like a Hamanian twist, mm -hmm. it, it's miraculous that it's continuous. And its continuity shouldn't be confused as any real continuity of a causal nature. Okay. Right? There, is, there is no coherent causal link that takes me from one point to the other yeah. point in time. And in that sense, continuity in the grand scale is just right. not, um, not meaningful. So all of these, the points that we have talked about, I think come together when we, when we think about the concept of knowledge, and this is also a good way to refer back to Vico, that mm -hmm. for Vico also, there was this problem with knowledge, because if, again, we want to think about in terms of the enlightenment ideas, the knowledge is very much, very structured, very conceptual, very abstracted, very mathematical, mm -hmm. very like, you know, have a very coherent structure to it. It doesn't have a very much of like an involvement of emotions, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Abstracting from, not only abstracting from the external object that we are examining, but abstracting from all sorts of relationships that we have with that thing, right? To get right. to know it. If we, I want to know someone's psyche, right? If I want to analyze, if you come, like, come, come up with the principles of psychology, right. I should like really dissociate myself. That's how I know it. If you are thinking about in terms of enlightenment thinking, like mm. the way that I will understand it, the way right. I get the principles is that I first will abstract from this person's case and that other person's case, right? I will get to this point that is all, you know, we are not talking about Tren or Aran or Emily. Yeah. It's just uh, about, you know, these uh, abstractions. We are talking about human psyche, right? Mm -hmm. And not only that, but also like if I'm a psychologist, I need to get rid of all of the emotional like elements for instance that i have with tren and emily to get into the point that i am knowledgeable about their psyche right there is something about that distancing that is very important in the enlightenment thought and i think both Rico and haman would be vehemently opposed right. to that approach because if going back to what i mentioned earlier if the right way to think of God is God as an artist and not a mathematician. That's a blasphemy to think of God to, to reduce God to a mathematical structure. Now, for instance, Haman mentions that to get to know uh, the language of a community, and as a result, the community right. itself, uh, you need to approach it with the passion of a friend, mm -hmm. a lover. Right? right, and that's the way to go. The way to go is not like some crafted distance, like uh, maybe a 
caricature of a, like an anthropologist. I don't know if that's actually the case, but like in the in the case that like you go there and just observe, right? You go observe this, write down like what are the rituals and like the chief laughed. You know what I mean? It's just right. very uh, very observational without really involvement. If mm. you not, I think from a Hamanian perspective, if you cannot make friends in a cult community, right. you have entered the community. If mm -hmm. you cannot cr create social bonds within a community, right. you have no access to that community, no matter how much you have a, like, a good observation of like how they are doing things. That doesn't matter. What matters is this intimacy. Intimacy matters. Knowledge through intimacy. That's right. what it is. And again, this is exactly, I think, what the verum, the certum verum, the right. call and the verum part, and the way again, um, using the charming language of Berlin, uh, <laughs> the sense of no knowledge in the sense of understanding a friend or a right. work of art, not like scientific understanding of the brain, like the, mm. the way we can understand an entire civilization or a joke or we know what is it to be poor or jealous or lover or a convert or a traitor is fundamentally different from like having the concepts of those things, first of all, and having a view of, you know, nature. Like, I don't think I should make this clear. Like Vico is very interested to say that, you know, this creates a very important distinction between like the way that we can understand what it means to be, a, to be jealous gives us certain access to that type of being, to that, that state of being, that we can never understand what it means to be like a flower, right? We, mm. can, we don't have that. Uh, I think Haman is not that much interested in making that distinction. He thinks of this as just like an approach. Only intimacy gives you access. Now, maybe mm. you know, the way to get like, intimate with a, with a flower, although we are not in the Vicoian sense the creators of the flower, right? The flower right. is like part of us. But I think it's it's that that point for Haman, the point of intimacy, not so much about like what you could be intimate about. At least from what Berlin gives us, I don't see anything that says that you cannot right. be intimate with nature. Uh, but of course, it's yeah. easy to understand this in terms of like the community of hum human beings and the type of knowledge that, uh, you know, the counter enlightenment figures are talking about the hineinfühlen right this is mm -hmm. uh, is capitalized here and even like the strange fascinating language of haman in just talking about this is in terms of the incest with our spiritual grandma the nature like that kind of a language that's what right. he is looking for yes that's just intimacy even with something that is it seems like that intimacy is forbidden that's the way to know that's the way to go yes that's it's, it's brilliant i really like um the point you raised even though um I, I'll, I'll say three things um first is an endorsement of uh, affirmation what you said that on, on the concept of love and the second or intimacy the second is um Developed attention that you mentioned, the cultural anthropology. How does that connect? A third is a kind of disagreement. Oh, we just said about the concept of a self. Um, whether Haman would take up a Hume's skepticism about a self. The first one in terms of um, love, I think very interesting. I'm I'm very intrigued by your um, discerning contrast between Vico's Sedum Verum and um, Hamas knowing um, a culture or tradition or oneself as not oneself but another person as through intimacy I think what goes down to that fundamental difference is whether they formulated a clear way to settle or demarcate the boundary of intimacy for um, Vico that boundary is fixed being human means we are in one camp. Flowers are never in this camp. We can never go into that camp. But for um, Haman, it's not very clear because, as you mentioned, it's uh, mysticism. It's at every moment of experience, it's a miracle. There's no such preconceived 
boundary if you follow that mysticism path. But on the other hand, we 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 didn't discuss. We did. We should bring the concept of faith into this. Um, and I think for him, knowing God for, for Haman, sorry, uh, to, knowing God is possible. My, my my guess. I have a quote. I don't have any quote. It's because the God makes the gap uh, irrelevant through incarnation. That the God is human through the person of Jesus. So therefore, the the, the for 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 Vico, the gap, the fundamental gap between human and non-human, at least for God, is suspended. Oh, but for other objects, I'm not sure. It's not very clear. But it seems that to know us. Um, as lovers mm -hmm. knowledge is very much informed by the Christian notion of uh, self-sacrificing, self-emptying love. Um, it's not just a love in the 18th century French, like aristocracy sense of uh, flirting, erotic, that kind of love. That's the first thing on love and that which is fundamental to the mystical experience or, or which constitutes human knowledge. Second is um, reacting to your point on cultural, cultural anthropology. Certainly, especially for traditional ethnography, establishing emotional bounds with a um, community and to really live the way they do is the prerequisite for any faithful and responsible report of what or characterization of what a society is really about. Um, this is like a push against because the very possibility whether one growing up in a completely different cultural setting would have the capacity to suspend that cultural sensitivity one is born into so as to acquire a completely different one that possibility is fundamentally denied or challenged severely of course i would say vico i'll say without hesitation for vico and for Haman, they are ultimately optimistic about this capacity to understand a different tradition or at least one's own tradition because something even more radically different between God and human, that knowledge was possible through revelation, through faith. Um, how could you separate a human being, um, introduce such an impossible uh, gap between human beings? That's just absurd. Of course, I would say that, especially postmodern critique of that, um, optimism itself is to a certain extent a natural implication or development of the... Um, pluralism sprouts or um, roots in that system introduced and the third the the the, the counting latin against um a, a universal approach towards the human expression of knowledge so i i think there are certain not inconsistency but at least tension there in their own first hand against the universal um principles of making knowledge but on the other hand um optimism in cross-cultural understanding, cross-historical, trans-historical understanding, which itself is a universal abstraction or a sort of universal uh, conviction. And the final thing is about the concept of self. I don't think Haman would go as far as um, Hume did in questioning human self. I think for, for Haman, human self did have... Um, a continuous existence as uh, as well as essence, so must exist for him, and in order for faith to stand, that the, the certain things are exempted from that so-called deconstruct mode of um, appreciating experience. So that the question and his sole justification for that, if I'm interrogating him, um, will be recourse to scripture to faith. So then it introduced the thing. I, th I think it's time for, for us now to summarize after you give you, me your mm -hmm. feedback on my thought. The concept of arbitrariness as the only reason for Haman to justify why if there's no universal laws, where, why there's no common denominator um, associating or connecting all human societies, he was still optimistic about uh, mystic experience or like that uh, this I'm feeling to, to, to be part of a very distant community. And why, if we can challenge causality, if we can challenge phys physical law, why 
are we assuming human beings are of like a permanent existence? Buddhists will certainly disagree with that. If you use the way to deconstruct the natural phenomena, you must apply that to like phenomena pertaining to the human as well as God. But for Haman, I don't think that was within his horizon. It's, it's out of question. So yes, go to you and we should yeah. wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I think this is going to be the last point that I'm going to say about Haman and his response to what you said. Um, the second point you went and the, the point you made after the first three points. So it seems like that for Haman, the problem with enlightenment is not only enlightenment makes abstractions, but that those abstractions are arbitrary, right? right. Like there are arbitrary abstractions and conflation of those arbitrary abstractions with reality or truth. That seems to be like a basic problem that um, Haman has with Enlightenment thinking. But it seems like that he actually is, you know, committing all of those crimes himself. Absolutely. Right. So he, first of all, in this notion of abstraction is very, very much contradictory in his own thinking. Because as Berlin, I think, mentioned, there is no thinking without abstraction, right? There is no thought, there is no language without abstraction. Right. And you can be a genuine skeptic and reject the possibility of language getting at any truths. I think you can definitely hold that position, but then you cannot be Haman. You must be silent. You mm -hmm. cannot enter the domain that you are trying to say that it's uh, uh, as, as nature and it's nature flawed and grasping anything. And if you're not doing that, so it seems like that you are as Haman uh, presupposing a legitimate ground for abstraction that you know, your abstraction falls under that, but like the enlightenment abstraction does not fall under that. But it seems like that the, this distinction is absolutely arbitrary um, because if you are, Haman is abstracting, not only because he's a thinking, but also because he's, he's abstracting from all sorts of other elements. For instance, it seems like that he is essentializing Christianity sure. in many different ways. Culture in like, general. Yeah, and culture in general, there's some unity to it. Where did that come from? And when we get to the depth of this, any 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 communication presupposes some level of abstracting from differences and establishing a plane of identity in which communication is possible. Right. Now, even if Haman in his more like dark days start to say that okay then that means that there is no communication between us and buddhists right there's that's impossible that's just an arbitrary stopping point mm -hmm. because communication is impossible if abstraction in that sense is not possible abstraction in the way that Haman is attacking it also will, will include the essence of communication right. like if there is communication, there is an understanding, implicit or explicit, that we are giving up a difference to have this plane, and this plane right. could give us, could create further differences. It's a very interesting structure mm -hmm. in terms of their relationship that if I am so self absorbed in my ineffable, sensual ex uh, uh, sense experiences right. right and i am unwilling to give up the quote-unquote uniqueness of the sense experiences right it, then it is impossible for me to communicate with any other human being because you can never really exactly feel the pain that i am feeling in my knees right now Right. right. That's impossible to, it doesn't make it, even if you have the physic, physicality of the same pain, your body structure is different. 
right? Mm -hmm. Your relationship with your knee is different, mm -hmm. right? It's all of those elements are important, right? right? Your history with your knee is different from me. And right. because of that, it is impossible for me to say the word, I feel pain, mm -hmm. right? So when I say I feel pain, the least that I am doing is saying that the uniqueness does not stop me from having a plane of communication with an other, right? And that is that requires some abstraction from the immediacy of the sense experience to be able to express conceptually and therefore communicate. Now, if you are Haman and this is a blasphemy, then it applies to you as well, to Haman right. himself. Right. Uh, how do you, what is culture? What is a society? Mm -hmm. What is a word? All of these elements at different levels require abstractions. And his abstractions, the difference between his abstractions and the enlightenment abstractions is that he points out the arbitrariness of the enlightenment abstractions, which may be true, but he commits even a more, mm -hmm. even a harsher prob, uh, uh, like uh, crime in the same territory. Because at least the Enlightenment thinkers are not necessarily thinking of abstraction as something like, you know, unholy, right? They right. might have a place for abstraction. But Haman thinks of it as like a hellish misunderstanding, mm -hmm. right? So for him, is even a more palpable sin than yeah. it is for the Enlightenment thinkers, because they, they can at least say that, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that it's abstraction, but we need abstraction for this sense. Um, so I think that's what I got for Haman. If you have something to add to Haman, you can add it, and then we can um, move to Herder. Yeah, so just very briefly, I think um, your critique of the self-defeating potential in Haman's system is very astute. I uh, very much agree with it. What I want to add is, um, I think I will just further add to the implication or the legacy of his ideas. Uh, first is, I think his provocative idea on the arbitrariness of, um, or spontaneous, how to put it, uh, the possible dissociation between meaning and the symbols really anticipates and perhaps filled into the later on uh, rise of the philosophical language. That's my feeling. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot talk about a human knowledge without now think about the problem of um, abstraction, symbol constructing, uh, which is a fundamental human communication. And uh, we must take, we must consider the distorting potential or at least or nature in any act of abstraction. I think that's very provocatively made in Haman's idea and is seriously taken by all thinkers, regardless of which camp they are in now. The second thing is just like the um, abstract, his attitude towards the abstraction, his concept of um, his attitude towards the faith, as we as I signposted some minutes ago. Um, it's very problematic because the faith for him was with a capital F. His idea really doesn't help us to make a sense of plurality for faith and what we should do given this. Our faith translatable or communicable or everybody just should be content of remaining in a silo and like kind of cultic of a society, like mm -hmm. fundamentally separated from a person with a so-called different mm -hmm. faith. And that connects with his idea of rendering so much importance or uh, necessity of a person's um, tradition. A human being is not a human being um, if he or she is not grounded in his tradition. Therefore, what makes his tradition his tradition, that to a certain extent, unique symbolic expression must not be relativized um, uh, through being absorbed or subsumed into a universal structure. And that would make the concept of tolerance, be it a cultural or religious tolerance, 
impossible because the being tolerable of a completely different worldview, say the Enlightenment worldview for him, is to, to not to take his conviction seriously. It's so not to take one's faith seriously. If if one does that, there's no way to attain any knowledge per se. So it's the 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 there could be very destructive um, implications, political implications of the elevated status Harmon gives to what is seemingly arbitrary um, cultural identity. I think that would later on tie through Herder or whatever to Germans' later intellectual development and political action. Yes, please. Yeah, so I, I think that's that's very true and that's very interesting. And I think it just goes back to that basic problem. Not only what what you correctly mentioned about like the faith and this, you know, harsh intolerance that comes as the result of it, it it is still for me very contradictory to think of the concept of faith with accepting other aspects of Haman's viewpoint. Because again, like when you're talking about faith, are we talking about something collective mm-hmm. or something absolutely individual? Is there some right. sort of universality to faith or it is about like an individual experience? Are we thinking about faith in the way that we're talking about the you know, experience of pain in my knees? Right. Or thinking about faith as something that is shareable, communicatable? Right. And if it's the sense experience equivalent in a very, very, very basic way, in a way that is ineffable, incommunicable, mm-hmm. then you can never speak of a Christian faith. No. Because that's a universal concept. You can have, you know, your heart, whatever you want to right. call it, and that's it. It's a very, very like isolated, not even at the level of communities, it's also a false abstraction. Right. Because again, if you want to go back and back, your faith can never be my faith. Um, just like your sense experience cannot never be mine. And mm. if that's the basis for everything else, there is no meaning for like, you know, the coalition of the Christians, right? The coalition of the pro- Lutherans. That doesn't mm. make any sense either. That's just like a obscene artificial unification in the right. matter of the universalization of the enlightenment in the exact same way that okay okay we have these differences but the common denominator is that we have faith <laughs> in like you know right. and whatever so that doesn't make any sense at that uh, at that level and i think a lot of these problems re-emerge in herder as well right Certainly. because the herder is again and a counter enlightenment person in some ways you know more sophisticated than both Vico and Haman. Um, same problems, you know the lowest common common denominator approach, the over categorization of right. men, right, and also added with the you know probably the beginning of industrialization, the mm-hmm. cosmopolitanism, the commercialism, all right. of those elements, the global economy starting to emerge and all of that locality is starting to fade away right. which is a very like palpable version of this thinking of this universality as the dominant monster that just like devours the individuals the way that the global market devours the individual markets and the global culture um, of humanity quote-unquote culture of humanity or human rights or something transcending all the cultures cultural differences, devouring that, all of those things are like the, the problems of uh, enlightenment that Herder is interested in. And all this enlightenment feeling of, you know, thinking of brotherhood and like we are all from the same kind for, right. for Herder, as, you know, the reference that Berlin mentions, is like burning with love for all of his fellow ghosts, right? That's the saturated heart of the superfluous cosmopolitan. That the individuality of his quote unquote brothers and sisters has been taken away. They this this altruistic uh, like sense of like we are all the same 
mm-hmm. is empty for her. There is no meaning to that because right. you have deprived of deprived everything that makes individuals from them. Right. And all you've got is the ghosts. And the the age is the age of half feelers and half thinkers, right? They're mm. not really there is no genuine feeling. You're like that kind of a feeling for humanity doesn't make any sense. Right. And we are thinking, but we're not really understanding like what is going on. And yes. with that, we have the three main points that Herder talks about that I think we should briefly mention uh, each of them. And you can go ahead and, you know, just elaborate on like what you, what you got and heard it, and then we can get into uh, the details of uh, his ideas. I'm not sure about you, but I think it might help. It might be helpful to you first to give a biographical sketch of her. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, I'll do that, and I'll talk about uh, the three um, key turns, and then you can yes. let your thought and elaborate. Um, so, Johann Gottfried Herder was born in uh, Morgen, which is uh, in the Contemporary Poland, but then in the Kingdom of Prussia, not very far from Königsberg, where um, Haman and the Imam the Count left in, in the year 1744. So at the age of 17, um, Herder enrolled at the University of Königsberg, uh, where he studied with both Kant and Haman. Afterwards, he became a clergyman and lived in a few um, fairly cosmopolitan cities, including Riga, then part of the Russian Empire, Nantes, and Strasbourg before France. Um, and in Strasbourg, in particular, uh, in particular, Herder met the young Goethe. The two set in motion the later on very famous Sturm und Drang movement. Um, and from the mid uh, 1770s onwards, he received um, court patronage and fame for his writing, and he was eventually ennobled, good for him, in, in 1802. And the three terms, um, Isaiah Berlin um, provides for, to, to, to guide the readers to, to think um, across the very diverse um, thought system of um, Herders are populism, expressionism, and pluralism. So, Ron, what's your take on um, the first one, populism? So, is that similar to our contemporary uh, Bach um, parallel, um, uh, the concept of populism versus it's like a nationalism? What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's a, a, at least Herder wants it to be very different, right? Because he wants this populism to be the value of belonging to a group or culture and not to a political community, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a politicized version of populism that someone comes up and say that, you know, I give like free potatoes, so they just vote for me. It's not that that it doesn't have that kind of connotation of populism being like to like manipulate or not even in a vicious way, but just use the uh, yeah, popular uh, demands of a group of people to just rule them. So Herder has very strong anti-statist uh, viewpoints, mm-hmm. thinking of the state as this unholy monster, the coldest of all cold monsters, right? Right. Like thinking of state as really turning that culture group that particularity that exists within a community because again we need to think about herder and all of these points in the context of the counter enlightenment and interest in the particular and the community is particular the nation is particular right and what he is interested in is not that political status of the elements of the culture but maintaining that particularity through rituals, traditions, clothing, food, dance, language in in the way that greetings work, like all the little points that exist within a community. And I think it's better to contrast it, or it is good to contrast it with something like the concern that we have, and it's a very contemporary concern about 
globalism, right? Mm -hmm. You go to like rural Iran or China and they are watching friends. Like it's like, you know, they are the thumbs up is becoming like something that everyone does, right? The clothing becomes something like the fashions uh, deciding the fashions in New York decide what happens in Beijing as well, right? It becomes something that more and more we are losing this diversity. And I think the populism that Herder is interested in is resistance towards that. Let let the nation be the nation. Let those elements exist. And I think his problem with the political dimension of this is that for him, contra the usual mistaken understanding of Hegel that thinks of him as like a statist, right? Um, Herder thinks the state is the rubber of individuality, right? right? Individuality fades away. Now, if the if a political unit or a political state capitalizes on the diversity of the locality of a culture, locality of a particularity of a nation, it just becomes poisoned. It becomes rigid. It right. becomes, it, in a Kantian way, it just becomes a means towards an end, right? <laughs> it becomes a means to just, you know, hyper-militarize and like invade right it just mm. like it becomes this favorite folk like they just like are the 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 people that are you know chosen and herder does not think that's what maintains the particularity of the individuals within a cultural sphere now you think though that <laughs> there is this contrast mm-hmm. on Herder's side is artificial in that it cannot be taken seriously in terms of like depriving it from the political, depriving populism in this sense from the political unit. So yeah, 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 certainly. Um, I had a very, I was internally very divided while reading that section. Oh, it's a, oh some part of it I find that um, Herder's the ambition or um, sermon to a large extent were very noble, but I just could not agree with him. I think the distinction he introduces between the folks and the state um, is a forced one, and also a forced one. Um, first. Populism concerns the human community for Herder, but that human community is not routinized in a uh, legalistic way. So it, I think for Herder, an individual is not, not an individual is not if he or she is not a part of a community. I think that line is very much in connection with like Harman's idea. And second, this community is the not politicized, definitely not a state. And third one is this, perhaps this community, what defines the, the community is not at the leadership, it's not the elite. So his focus is really on folklores, mm. like uh, folk music, folk uh, cuisine, like not like court cuisine diet, because those only reflect a certain very... Um, Arbitra- not artificially segregated to the small minorities that are interested in the taste which does not necessarily reflect the uh, concern of the locality. I think your um, past and present um, analogy is very um, telling here. What is really global and cosmopolitan in, say, the 20th century, is not use our century as an example, we're usually connected with the upper society, high society. Like fashion show in all big s- cities, they look the same because they come from the hands of a s- several globally appreciated, so to speak, a designer's hands. And, but that, that doesn't necessarily penetrate. In these days might be different, but those who did not necessarily penetrate to the so-called folk tradition, what it was put on at like, uh, um, Matsuri in, in Japan, like at festivals, that sort of thing. So those for um, Herder was a better venue 
for us to really understand and appreciate what a culture or tradition is really about. And those things are for her to both a great means to, for a individual as well as the, the, the group to express themselves. So this populism is connected with this expressionism. And also it's a great way for us to appreciate the, the, the diversity of localities and different ways people um, expressing themselves also help us to understand the pluralistic nature of a uh, human being because expression is central to uh, human existence but for me i think what i did what i just did was a kind of summary of the situation from her perspective but for me this dichotomy is a is a flawed first very very often political as well as the power dynamics is always there in disseminating certain taste. It doesn't necessarily have to take the form of stated legislation. For instance, in certain country, men or women will have a specific coding, uh, coding code, like you should not wear such a, such a thing during such a period if you're who and who. Like all cultures to a certain extent had that until perhaps our time. Um, those things would stay with the people, the folks, even when the state collapsed. So the there is certainly communication between what is in his eyes an Aubrey, uh, artificially codified realm and what is the naturally and spontaneously passed down realm. There isn't a such a impossible um, um, difference between legal code and customs or. Uh, tradition so to speak and I, yeah and that, that's pretty much i have on um populism do you have anything to react to that yeah i, I have a question for you regarding Go for what it. you said yeah. so from what i understood I, I think there is there is a part that i have a hard time understanding so i think you're your basic point is that the 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 difference between or the rigid distinction between the state and uh, you know the custom of the folk right right the people right that distinction does not hold in terms of that they are intertwined it's not that it's, this is just going its own way and uh like there are you know two independent right. lines right? right but i think you mentioned it which sounds like a <laughs> you know like an accurate um historical observation too that when a state collapse collapses right. it's not like that uh, suddenly the clothing mm -hmm. starts to change. collapse right so to herder's defense that might show us something like if the whatever like just to give like an example like the global market economy collapses mm -hmm. like and there is no fashion shows in New York City, right? Like it's over. That Got is a over. bit. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, at least it's not like, you know, communicatable for whatever reason to people. Right. Get cheese, right. It's the, the line is cut. The, the connection is cut. Right. Now, I'm sure a lot of things disappear. Right. When there is no, that higher level state market, those mm -hmm. layers aren't there something disappears but i really doubt it's you know this the lullaby that mm -hmm. like americans used to you know put their children into sleep right or the children's stories that they read to them or like the way that they greeted one another right, right would suddenly collapse right and if it doesn't suddenly collapse doesn't that suggest that the distinction that Herder makes between these two layers has some legitimacy in terms of there is a folks layer that should be our focus. So forget about the glamour of, sure. you know, New York Fashion Week or, you know, the State of Union as it's you know, given by the President of the United States. You know, right. those are, you know, forced in a way. Yes. Yes. Very much dependent on this economic s structure, but like if that if that goes away, there is something that is still mac and cheese is not going away, 
right? Right. Mac and cheese is going to be be around, which mm. mu- it might go away at some point. <laughs> right. But it doesn't go away like like immediately. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I my reaction twofold. First, um. I have no problem accepting certain cultural elements that are more robust or persist, persistent than other. But I do not think that spectrum is, first of all, a binary. Second, is clearly uh, defined by the cultural symbol or text the relationship to the concept of state as um, Herder understands it. Second is if you really look at a lot of a cultural context, if they could survive across the generation and time, very often it's because that human group came up with a certain mechanism to preserve, to pass down certain lullabies, certain mm-hmm. like nursery rhymes, whatever. And um, those that desire to conserve certain practices, especially during times of conflict, when they're in ex- um, communication and exchange with another cultural group, usually went hand in hand with not necessarily state, but definitely a political expression of a boundary making. And that could take form through like religious identity, could take take a form of the like, political identity. It's the concept of abstract concept called sovereignty, I think, to which people, uh, from which people derive the um, claim of deciding which type of food, which type of clothes, which type of calendar they will observe. Um, it's, it's hard to g- generalize it as a global state, but in certain uh, religious traditions, at least in my reading to a large extent, they are just a shadow or the submerged version of a state or um, empire. What it used to be upheld by, say, the Jewish first or second temple, or the um, king of the United uh, Judah and Israel right now is uh, is gone because the state was conquered now part of the, the Roman Empire. But nonetheless, we can use a different realm, like a so-called religion, to foster that um, will to submit to this so-called cultural command, and. Um, so the state non-state thing is really subject to different social actors negotiation and expression as not a state is one among several really powerful symbols in the communicative realm it's not in a um it's not just the material and the concrete action that shapes the human being's life. It also passes it as uh, uh, leaves a uh, long-lasting legacy on the way people conceptualize um, abstract concepts like social relationship. If you examine, say, not necessarily necessarily rhymes, but what I can think of as really Chinese idioms, those a lot of them were referring back to specific historical figures and uh, dynasties or polities. Same thing you can, uh, if you go to like really Catholic or so-called conservative society, memories of saints, those sort of things were perhaps initially connected with state making, po- political like a patronage. But later on, even though the um, uh, political situation changed um, uh, radically, the names of the saints, their stories, and the connection with certain cultural places cons- um, preserved. So those things would definitely be classified as a folk tradition in Herder, but they're sure. a region point or a very important part of the dissemination of promulgation was very much connected with state power. So it's that if you take history seriously, you will see uh, what's is in the state realm, what is in non-state realm, really is not uh, decided once for all, but they change and 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 woven. Um, a community is never immune to the political development throughout the history. So, in that sense, I disagree with Herder's interpretation. 
I see. That's a very interesting point. Yeah. And, and it also changes the view on like the, or, or, or it kind of like brings into light the, na- the, the concept of what is political. I feel like that it's right. It's thinking of that folk element of culture as something apolitical that, you know, it has like a transmission of its own kind that is independent from the political sphere and therefore the state seems to be too naive and like something that seems to be part of the folk, a benign part of the folk, you know, manners, a lullaby or a song or a, a cuisine, when you really analyze it, you would say, oh, okay, this... This is with us because of this, you know, political act like two centuries before that mm. made this persist. Right. Instead of this other cuisine and instead of this other ritual, instead of this other clothing that is right. very much intertwined with the acts of not a state as an independent agent, but also as those, all, all of those people as the state. Right. Um, it, it, the, the political act of them. So in terms of like how this problem with Herder could like change our understanding of the nature of politics and in terms of like what is politics, it's going to be interesting, especially when we start talking about Hegel later on in, in, in this yeah. series, like how, yes. how that's going to come out. So I think we could move on to uh, the last two elements. And I do not have much to say about expressionism, but I have some stuff to say about pluralism, which I think could summarize our discussion and kind of like shed light on where we're where we are heading from here. In terms of expressionism, it's to me, it doesn't seem like a very sophisticated claim to be honest it just it's just saying that like works of art and artifacts that human activity brings about has that experience uh, ex- expressive element in it in terms of the expressive personality of the individual or the group and i get that but i i don't see i don't see this as a very deep like discovery at all? Uh, what, what what is your what is your? I I I'm very much. I was overwhelmed reading this. It's uh it's like my in my nightmare come true. It's something I try to forget. I would try to write out of my life's concern, but this one just uh, reminds me very explicitly. Um. I think it is a conclusion. If you distill it to a doctrine, it becomes a very superficial. But what is really intriguing is the assumptions behind such a claim. That is, I think um, there are one, two, three, four, four things involved. First, um, tradition is, is essentialized. You can study one, say, a work of art. And that one work of art is a condi- is is only possible because of the cultural con- uh, possibilities, and that cultural possibilities reflects that a tradition, and that tradition is very similar to what we discussed about the Haman is essentialized concept, the Christian faith. Like yes, second um, self individuality is essentialized here, like um, by studying. Because self, self is, he says that a human being is half dead. I'm not sure whether this is my notes or what he's saying. Anyway, the spirit is the same. That a human being is not really or fully a human being unless that he is in the um, community. So in order to understand that person, you must understand the essentialized community he is situated in. So there is a one-to-one matching relationship between a person and a community. That is very important for, or has a really troubling um, um, implication for the understanding of plurality of identity and also multiplicity of identity, which will be our final point. But the third thing I think is that there Given this two essentialized and one to one um, coupled um, entity, self and community, um, you have a 
organic, holistic um, a, um, correlation or interdependence across all realms of expressions. So one community, say 18th century uh, Alsace, like the Franco-German border, if we're culturally very unique, we, if we can deconstructualize, decontextualize that area and make it a culture, you'll see it's a cuisine. It's very much reasonable because it reflects the, the ritual calendar. The ritual calendar is connected with the local folk tales, folk tales about the places and the saints. And those things are connected with the, the, the old Alsatian language. Everything is organically connected. So the fourth thing is um, about methodology and um, epistemology. If we have only one aspect towards a historical society, we can reconstruct the spirit of that society. Therefore, we can understand that culture. I think that in that sense, um, Herder is very similar with, on one hand, Vico and um, Haman, that you can have a mystical, very intimate relationship with another human society. For Herder, uh, both of them, all three of them placed a lot of emphasis on the study for languages. Because language really gives you at least a, a false confidence in my eyes, that you really know how people communicate, which I disagree with. But for them, yes, that is only defensible if you say, as long as we have a glimpse, but a very intimate glimpse of how a society is communicating, then we know the society. That's, I think, the implication of the third point. You can disagree on that. But on the other hand, that puts the herd really... <laughs> In the camp of a contemporary, I would say, many numerous uh, uh, social scientific and humanity, uh, humanities disciplines by studying how a gender norm is construed in a society, you know the society. By studying how a specific religious denomination function in the society, you know the society. So mm. the there is a, um, how to say, it justifies um, singly arbitrary, well, arbitrarily demarcated disciplinary approach. And the use of that, you can meaningfully study a society as a whole. You can take a religious studies approach. You can take a philological approach. You can take an art historical approach. They all reflect the essence of a society. And the, I think the implication in our time is really in the concept of an interdisciplinary what unifies, say, you can put the histo art historian of 18th century China, or archaeologist of 18th century China, and a, say, like, um, the ph philologist of 18th century China, and a literary person of lit uh, uh, 18th century China, you can force them to come up with a synthesis of the spirit 18th century sure. China, which I think is only defensible if you first essentialize the cultural category, and you believe any narrowly limited approach towards one field of expression mm -hmm. is very much in a pool, it's a drive, it's from a pool, it reflects that organically connected uh, sim symbolic system. And that is a, that a material, non material symbolic system is also mapped onto a group of people's existence. So those are the assumptions, I think, uh, implicit, at least in expressionism. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think I think you, yeah, the, the points that you are, like, like as the assumptions you are digging out of this, it's very, very, very important. Uh, yes. And to me, it's very ironic that Haman, Herder, and Vico, these great of enlightenment when it comes to some very basic matters how much they mirror the exact right. same like a structural problem that they are trying to combat Seven. now one is like this emphasis in language is very interesting to me mm -hmm. that first of all language is the territory of concepts and right. universals in that sense and it's very odd that especially for Herder and Haman that think that you know have this problem with universality 
and, and concepts, they think of that as the key to the nation, right? As the entry point to the nation. But it's also, you know, their problem, the counter enlightenment problem with the enlightenment is that you are universalizing human nature and then you are, you know, essentializing the relation between the particulars only relative to this universal, right? That's the problem with the Enlightenment project. But it seems to me that someone like Herder is doing the exact same thing within the culture. Right. You know, there is the culture that is now the universal and the individuals, like the individual members are part of that. Right. Uh, you know, they are relativized to the universal. Right. And, and this doesn't end. You know, it's one of those situations that you know, you no matter how much of a localist you become, there is more, there is a locality that you're suppressing. Mm-hmm. That's how you can be a localist. You become a localist as opposed to a globalist by essentially essentializing some aspects of that quote unquote locality and thinking of that as the essence of it. Now, the structure becomes the same. Every expression is subsumed under the expression of that locality. Right. Not a difference, but an identity. And with that, the exact same problem with the Enlightenment thinking, Mm. back again, is just happening at a level lower than the level of the Enlightenment. In short, and I think that's going to be part of the last, like, plurality, pluralism point. In short, the counter enlightenment as understood in the context of the thoughts of Vico, Herder, and Haman is incapable of resolving the tension between the universal and the particular. It just gets annoyed at the relationship at the level that enlightenment is obsessed with. Right. But transforms that and trans like in different parts of their thinking, it just brought back to the level of locality, for instance. And I think in terms of the emphasis that Herder has for pluralism, in the sense that there is some incompatibility of, you know, equally valid ideals, right? That the ideal man and the ideal society are intrinsically incoherent concepts and they're meaningless. And Herder, according to Berlin in this sense, wants to be an objective pluralist, not a subjectivist, right? right? There is an element that these standards matter, but at the global level, we don't have the standard. But I think it's the exact same problem with the, with, with the other part, that you're essentializing, like, why did, how, where's the derivation of the right to shift the essentialization from the global human nature to the right. localized german nature a uh, german G- german nation like how did that why is that a boundary like how, how did we get to that boundary that seems as arbitrary going yes. back to the Haman part that seems as arbitrary as picking something about human beings and say that okay okay so rationality is what is unifying us, right? And just mm. disregarding the exceptions, the insane, the invalid, the whatever, like getting rid of all of that and the, all the acts that are not really easily categorizable as rationality. Now, in Germany, you could do the same with the diversity of the locality. What gives this unity? That the unity that is needed for any objective pluralist viewpoint, right? Because if you're an objective pluralist, you want to say there are spheres that are separated and they have their own intrinsic structure that is incommensurable with other, you know, spheres. There are validities and there are problems. There could be problems within each of them, so on and so forth. There could be like some paths to understand these other cultures. That's also true. But there is no, you know, unified valid value standard or ideal that is uh, possible at the global level. Why is that ideal possible at the national level? Why is that possible in a city, in a, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a village? Like who decides 
for a human being. Like if you get back, it just it just collapses into this subjectivist mm-hmm. viewpoint that we, right. we're talking about when we're talking about Haman did yes, faith, sure. Now you want to do the exact same thing that Herod is doing with like folk with mm-hmm. faith, communities of faith. Right. Like we are the Lutherans, those are the Catholics, those are the Muslims. And okay, we can Zich hineinfühlen. We can we can do that. Like we can right. get to know it as like in, in in with intimacy, mystical intimacy, and all of that. But you know there are separations and there are ideas. Right. There's just internalized these structures, um, and you know we can talk about maybe about those ideas within each of mm-hmm. these um, spheres, but no global one. But the cap faith with capital F, as you were saying, right. is itself uh, an essentialization and universalization that has no means other than subsumption of the individuals under itself, and they cut them to fit into the the universalist vision, unless it takes its position really seriously. And if it takes the position really seriously, then everything collapses. Right. There is no nation. There is no faith. There is no community. There is no folk. Like I make my mac and cheese different from you. Who is to say that that difference is abstractable? Right. Who is there to say that that difference doesn't matter? Because that's exactly what the Enlightenment people do to different right. between mac and cheese and whatever, like uh, uh, pad thai, right? Mm-hmm. Just like okay, okay, this is all food. Like right. we all eat food, right? That kind of a thing. And that's yeah. a lot of abstraction. Why is that the same thing cannot happen to like how we make mac and cheese in Austin, Texas and how people make it in San Antonio, right. Texas? Like not even a different state. So that seems to be going by circling back to the problem with not only the problem with the universal in particular, but also the problem with arbitrary abstraction yes. that seems to like poison the counter enlightenment thinking thinkers as much as uh, it poisons their opponents right. and this is i think this is going to be a gonna make the next stage of our conversations very interesting because mm-hmm. we're like uh, focus on hegel and hegel right. seems to be a person that at least attempts and understands these understands that the both sides of this equ- equation mm-hmm. do not work, right? The, the difference that I think someone like Hegel introduces to the picture is that he doesn't fall into each category, and he but he come he tries to come up with something that doesn't have doesn't have the same problems. So that will be it for me. Do you have yes? Any I have one notes? final thing to say. Um, yeah. Which is the um, for me, I don't know her for her the, or a Haman, where does a specific culture stand or locate? Is it in the realm of symbols or is it in the realm of experiences? They are very, very different things. It seems like their approach towards um a different, say cultural setting or community is through the unfeeling, which is the fundamentally or mystical experience empiricism. It's connected with the self, the knower experience. However, however, for instance, faith, let's just take Lutheran faith. Like you need a Bible, right? And the Bible is not experience per se. It is symbolic as expression. It's already abstracted. You mentioned the language writing system. It's abstracted things for that. And once, and in, in, in empirical observation, in history, what we can observe as cultural historians are once a thing is um, symbolized, that a symbol started to gain an independent life. Of the community that made it, uh, uh, we see people change their languages all the time, but that doesn't mean the cultural assumptions and notions that uh, codified or uh, enshrined in the uh, original speech necessarily went away with the switch of the switch of tongue. So. Um, I'm not going to go through the um, more profound and um, 
ground level critique you mentioned is the uh, un um, universal and a particular one. I'm just using their assertions um, and the, the assumptions that are behind such assertions that to the point of some um, inconsistency or self-defeating tendency in their thinking. Um, one is if cultures are truly incommensurable with each other, then how can we really know? And second, if cultural identities are incommensurable, how can a person has multiple such collective identities? And we've, in our time, we should all acknowledge that a person if definitely carries with him or her in social um, exchange recognition or communication, a, a vast number of identities. Many of them, according to her, the possibly be impossible to coexist. So how do we make sense of that? Um, how is, say, acculturation possible? Like naturalization, how could an immigrant become an American? Like all those questions, I think their system does not provide a tool to really um, examine, scrutinize, let alone resolve, primarily because I think, as you said, they in criticizing the um, um, enlightenment problems, um, commit the same problem and refuse to acknowledge they have the same problem. So we should definitely find a different realm from their like approaches towards um, prioritizing certain aspects of human life and experience over others to solve this enlightenment, counter enlightenment dynamic and debate that's all i have to say yes i think i think you mentioned very very interesting points especially the <laughs> difference between like the locating culture and like finding it whether in symbols and experiences and the contradictions that exist in picking each especially if you're a counter enlightenment um figure and all of these contradictions and paradoxes and criticism turning into unauthorized self-criticisms right criticism of enlightenment ending up being the criticism of counter enlightenment as well it, all of these elements need a different level like a, a deeper level of understanding of very basic uh, concepts that are in play in all of these discussions that like seem to sometimes disguise themselves as observations of culture or you know well, religious experiences they all understanding them they they have that basic conceptual layer that what we are going to do in the next few weeks um is going to be the focus on that basic layer from the perspective of um post-Kantian German philosopher, another German in the list, and it's going to be Hegel. And probably we spent a good time thinking through these problems and paradoxes and in the most general sense, the relationship between universality and particularity um, from Hegel's perspective. And also we will use resources from contemporary Hegelian thinkers, like Gillian, uh, Julian Rose, to fathom the intricacies of Hegel's thought and how he could be differentiated from both enlightenment and counter enlightenment thinkers. And with yes, that, sir. I think we could we could wrap this up. Yes. So dear listeners, please stay attuned. Uh, Rose Hegel Control Sociology is coming up. I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Take care.